Hi everyone, thanks for joining this morning. Um, so today I will be talking to you about how you can support neurodiversity in the workplace. I'm delighted to say that I'm joined by Jonathan Harper, who's Chief Executive of Para Orchestra, which is a Bristol-based charity whose ensemble orchestra of disabled and non-disabled professional musicians produce large-scale music projects in the UK. Jonathan has kindly agreed to share some insight into how Para Orchestra is a fully inclusive organisation supporting a broad range of disabilities and he will be sharing with us how they support neurodiversity at Para Orchestra. <coughs> Next slide please. So like yourselves who are here today, many organisations are keen to learn more about this topic and to understand how they can best support a cohesive, inclusive and neurodiverse organisation, as well as ensuring they are informed and engaged with manage, managing all employees effectively. The concept of neurodiversity has become more widely regarded and acknowledged in the business press and TV series, such as the Employables, the Undateables or the Netflix series currently running a fourth season of Atypical. Some organisations have already begun to prioritise neurodiversity. Microsoft, BT, Google and Ford are among some of the big names all running neurodiversity at work initiatives or in the process of developing one to target inclusion. <clears throat> I also have lived experience of neurodiversity as my son is ADHD. So I appreciate that living or working with someone who is neurodiverse has its challenges, but from personal experience, I've found that educating myself and broadening my knowledge through reading, webinars, podcasts, etc., has enabled me to talk to him in an open, safe space, which has helped him enormously. So I think organisations who understand neurodiversity and want to actively take steps to create an open and supportive working environment will prove hugely beneficial and provide everyone with great opportunities for the future. So today we will define neurodiversity and consider who falls under this criteria. I'll give you some examples of conditions that are deemed neurodiverse and provide you with some statistics regarding how many people are impacted in the UK. We'll think about why it's important and discuss how workplaces can support individuals and think about the benefits to the organisation of being inclusive. Next slide, please. So as you can see from this word cloud, neurodiversity covers a huge range of conditions, symptoms and challenges. We can't possibly understand each of these condi conditions in detail, but as employers, colleagues and friends, we can increase our understanding around the subject and consider adjustments that can be made to create a more diverse and inclusive work environment as possible. Next slide, please. So we'll start with a couple of definitions. The language used in today's world to describe differences in brain function are neurodiverse and neurotypical. So I've put a definition up on the slide here. The CIPD, CIPD's definition also states that neurodiversity is ultimately a biological fact of the infinite variety of human neurocognition. Now the same term neurodiversity is also being used to represent a fast growing subcategory of organizational diversity inclusion that seeks to embrace and maximize the talents of people who think differently. The way we learn differs enormously from person to person. Personally, I've always found, you know, at school listening in class for an hour quite challenging, but if I wrote notes, asked questions and even drew mind maps, this would be a much better approach than just listening to someone speaking. I learn in a much more visual way. Um, I find that I can remember a picture much better than I could remember text. Next slide, please. This is a definition of neurotypical individuals. So it refers to someone who the brain functions, behaviors and processing is considered standard or typical. As you can see, it's defined as being within the normal range of cognitive function in relation to their ability to process information and behaviours. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so it's important at the outset to consider that psychologists and educators promote and are trained to position neurodiversity as within individuals rather than between individuals. 
The psychological definition refers to diversity within an individual, individual's cognitive ability, wherein there are large statistically significant disparities between peaks and troughs of the profile. And this is known as a spiky profile as shown in this diagram. The diagram is adapted from the British Psychological Society reports on psychology at work and depicts scores from the Wechsler Adult Intelligence Scale, which provides clear guidance on the level of difference between strengths and weaknesses that is typical or of clinical significance. Scores are used to support diagnosis of dyslexia, developmental coordination disorder, previously known as dys dyspraxia, and attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, ADHD, and to understand the cognitive ability of an employee following injury or illness. A neurotypical is thus someone whose cognitive scores fall within one or two standard deviations of each other, forming a relatively flat profile. Be those scores average, above or below. Neurotypical is numerically distinct from those whose abilities and skills cross two or more standard deviations within the normal distribution. So uh, an example with my son is that his working memory and his spelling is considered well below normal thresholds. So if I said, can you go upstairs, clean your teeth and bring down your glasses? Inevitably, he would come down with clean teeth, but without his glasses. So I've learned to simplify instructions and not overcomplicate them, and that works much better. He will have simply forgotten in this example about the glasses altogether, as it will leave his brain as soon as I have said it, as this is too much to remember. However, he is a whiz at maths and beats me every time at chess, as he thinks so strategically and plays the game out in his head and is one step ahead of me every time. To refer to individuals, the terms neurodivergent, neurodifferent and neurodiverse are in current use in both academically and for self-identification. In recognition of the lack of consensus regarding the term is more appropriate, all may be referred to interchangeably, asking individuals how they prefer to identify. Spiky profile conditions have historically been grouped under umbrella terms such as hidden impairments, specific learning disabilities, and neurodevelopmental disorders. A new umbrella term is proposed for included conditions that is neutral and statistically accurate, neuro-minorities. This is a work in progress, so we need to look out for further research and recommendations about this. So we'll now move on to the most common conditions that fall under the neurodiverse umbrella. <clears throat> So this slide shows the most common conditions that are associated as being neurodiverse. Autism spectrum disorder um, was once known as Asperger's syndrome, so Asperger's now sits under ASD. Just a couple of sort of definitions here. So dyscalculia is difficulty with numbers and maths. Dysgraphia is difficulty with writing. Dyslexia is difficulty with reading. Dyspraxia, difficulty with coordination, and there's many other definitions on that slide there for you to see. Next slide, please. I'm going to have a couple of polling questions now. Um, if you wouldn't mind putting those up, great. So um, the first one is, what percentage of the UK population do you think are identified as neurodiverse? If everyone could answer, that'd be great. Okay, so the majority feel that it's probably 15% or 20%. Um, those that said 15% are correct. So that's nearly one in seven people. And the next question, please. So what percentage of autistic adults are in paid employment in the UK?
Thank you. Um, so it's pretty even here between 6, 16 and 26. The answer is 16%. So very, very small number of autistic adults in paid employment in the UK. So what we can see here is that a potentially large number of your workforce are managing a condition that they may not have disclosed to you as an employer. Research undertaken by Bupa in 2022 found that only 43% of those with less visible disabilities had chosen to disclose those to their employer. 23% of those stated that they had not disclosed because they were worried that they would not be believed. Historically, the number of employees that share this information is minimal, largely due to the stigma around some conditions. Employees may feel that they wish to keep this information confidential due to concerns. It may have a detrimental effect on working relationships, opportunities for develop and development and promotion, or they don't want it to impact their roles in any way. Employees may also not identify as neurodiverse. The number of people seeking diagnosis for neurodiversity as the symptoms of these conditions have become more, more well known is rising. Waiting lists for diagnosis are also excessive, particularly after COVID, where there was a huge backlog. Give you an example, some private companies in Bristol even closed their waiting lists due to the pure number of referrals they were getting. So if you think about this issue, if it's the same across the country, which I imagine it is, you can start to understand and appreciate the number of people that are potentially neurodiverse and seeking diagnosis and further understanding. And I imagine this will this percentage will rise in the coming years. So it's therefore important that organisations get engaged now. I'm now going to introduce Jonathan, um, and I just wonder if Jonathan, you might be able to share with us your experience regarding the stigma point, because I know you had some thoughts on this. Yeah, thanks, Helen. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Jonathan, Chief Executive of Power Orchestra. Um, for those that don't know us, I mean, had, uh, had a great introduction, but um, we are as much about creating really fantastic music and art and performing for audiences around the country and around the globe as we are about completely turning the dial on who can be part of an orchestra. Um, and my starting point is always to understand that a traditional orchestra is built around a model that hasn't changed for centuries, you know, the idea of being a musician performing in a mainstream non-disabled orchestra is all about performance, it's about athleticism. Um, you have to learn the pieces as quickly as possible, you have to play them at the top of your game always, you're travelling, you know, uh, in and out of a venue in a day, um, your rehearsal times are very fixed, the conductor doesn't take any rubbish from anyone. Um, and Power Orchestra has 40 musicians, professional musicians, you know, we're not an amateur orchestra, we're professional. We have 40 professional musicians that identify as disabled, uh, deaf or neurodiverse. Um, we're about a quarter identify with a neurodiversity um, and it is a mix. We, do not, we understand that disability is a very broad church, so someone might have a mobility issue, a disability, but also um, identify with a neurodiversity. And the thing for us is understanding the stigma because um, anecdotally, 80% uh, of our musicians told us that during their training at music school, they were told not to disclose their disability. Um, they were told that if they did, whatever that disability would be, um, they wouldn't get work because the sector wouldn't allow them to have work because of the model it, it works to. And, and that's really why Power Orchestra is all about breaking that down because it seems absolutely crazy that if 20% of the population is disabled and 15% might have a neurodiversity, that those people are excluded. For us, difference is really good and creating a culture where you can understand and talk about that is important to Power Orchestra, uh, as you might expect. Uh, and perhaps the thing with the stigma around neurodiversity is even more interesting because within the classical music sector, it, it, it's still not understood there was a survey of, to understand the diversity of musicians two years ago. And there, was, there wasn't even a box to say, if you're a musician, that you had a neurodiversity. You know, you could tick that you were disabled um, or that you had a mental health issue, but you couldn't say you had ADHD, Asperger's, um, Tourette's. You couldn't, you couldn't say that. So 
So there is a real stigma for us. And, and actually, I just need to add that, I mean, I'll talk a bit about how we break that down at Power Orchestra. But internally, from our admin staff, I think it's only the last two or three years that we've really understood what it means for an admin staff to have a neurodiversity. We follow the social model of disability, which says that anyone can tell, anyone can identify with a disability. It's not a medical situation, but we're starting to really understand what it means for the admin team, uh, of which uh, 25 percent identify with neurodiverse as neurodiverse. And it's, it's that stigma that, um, Helen, you just mentioned for us as well as, under, as really understanding that that person is dealing with a whole load of challenges outside of their work environment, whether they're a musician or they're an admin staff member. You know, get, getting a GP appointment is, it's hard. Uh, getting your message across to the doctor about what you might need when you don't understand it and they're also learning is also hard. So for us, it's about creating a workplace, whether you're a musician or you're a staff member, where you can be open and, and we can explore what needs to change. That's really helpful, Jonathan. Thank you. <clears throat> I just, um, just yeah. had one question, which um, if I could just pop in with that. Um, it's a question about the percentage of neurodiverse individuals. Are the 15% identified as neurodiverse diagnosed or not diagnosed? Um, they're, they're diagnosed. So, so that was my point really about the fact that so many people are still waiting for the diagnosis um, and going through that process um, and you know I, I'm on Facebook pages and things like that um, particularly about ADHD but what we're finding is lots of adults and lots of people later in life are being diagnosed now as um, having a neurodiversity so as I said, I think that number will rise, um, both for people learning more about it and therefore wondering if they themselves have a neurodiversity and then obviously going through the diagnosis process. So I think it will, will rise significantly. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> Just some statistics here, really. Um, that show whilst organisations are increasing their understanding around neurodivergence and having the intention to make positive change, they are behind the curve. Um, and one of the greatest barriers is that neurodiversity simply isn't prioritised in many companies' diversity and inclusion strategies. The majority are focusing on gender, ethnicity and cultural background. Many neurodiverse uh, diverse, um, workers are not in mainstream employment at all. Only 16% of autistic adults are in full-time paid employment in the UK, compared with 47% of disabled people and 80% of non-disabled people. So it's important to remember that neurodiversity itself may be considered a dis disability too. And we'll move on to that shortly. Neurodivergent conditions can be less apparent to others and some even consider these as an invisible disability. Dyslexic people are up to five times more likely to be unemployed and dyslexic thinkers make up four in 10 of the unemployed population. With 10 to 16% of the population affected by dyslexia, even if we take the lowest figure, this equates to around 7.3 million people in the UK and globally, this is about 800 million people. 35% of entrepreneurs identify themselves as being dyslexic, signaling that businesses are failing to attract and retain a significant pool of creative, ambitious and success driven talent. An academic research by Mitchell in 2021 found that 94% of disabled people were worried that employers would not employ them due to their disability. And only 11.7% felt their manager had received adequate training on how to support disabled employees. Whilst this research was sample was not solely made up of neurodiverse employee workers, it would be safe to conclude that similar feelings may be common amongst neurodiverse workers. And it might provide some explanation for why many neurodiverse people who are not, work, are not working in mainstream employment. Next slide, please. So it's important for us to understand how the employee's neurodiversity could qualify as a disability under the Equality Act 2010. However, all neuro, not all neurodivergent employees will consider themselves to have a disability. Under the law, employees have the right to identify as having a disability. 
or not to identify. But the legal definition of disability means that neurodivergent workers are likely to meet the conditions. Government guidance states that a disability can arise from a wide range of impairments which can be developmental, such as autistic spectrum disorders, dyslexia and dyspraxia. It's important to note that while some may identify as disabled, in order to gain the protection of the Equality Act, they would need to satisfy the requirements set out in the def definition of a disability, and this would identify if they are covered. For example, if someone said that they consider themselves disabled, if they didn't meet the definition, they wouldn't be covered. If an employee is considered disabled, employees have a duty to make reasonable adjustments to allow them to perform their best work and protect them from discrimination, harassment and victimisation. Similarly, workers that are protected from discrimination by association. This means that if an employee is associated with a person who has a disability, such as a partner, child or person they care for, they are also protected from discrimination, victimisation and harassment under the law. Next slide, please. So I'm just going to give you a, a few examples of recent case law, um, which sort of highlights whether someone is covered or not. Um, just some examples. So in Jandu versus Marks and Spencers, Miss Jandu was neurodivergent and has dyslexia. She was employed by Marks and Spencers as a floor planner, and she'd worked for the chain for a number of years and had been regarded as a high performer. When the industry was struggling during COVID, Marks and Spencers commenced a large organizational restructure. And as part of that restructure, a scoring matrix was used to identify those that would be at risk. Each employee in the pool was scored out of four for their behavior, leadership skills, and technical skills. Miss Jandu had an overall score of 70%. And if she'd received one more point, she would have an equal score to two other employees. She was criticised for her behaviour, specifically the tone of her emails. She'd never previously been provided with feedback regarding the tone of her emails and had actually requested reasonable adjustments, which had not been implemented by them in relation to emails. This scoring resulted in her dismissal due to redundancy. Her, Ms Jandu was successful in her claim and was ultimately awarded more than £50,000. The Employment Tribunal upheld her claim that she was discriminated against due to factors arising from her disability. Marks and Spencers failed to consider reasonable adjustments in their process and did not seek medical ex uh, expert medical advice. The em Employment Tribunal also upheld her claim that she'd been dismissed unfairly and stated that even if reasonable adjustments had been made to accommodate her disability through the selection process, the selection process was inherently unfair as the criteria was too subjective in nature. So this case is a cautionary tale and shows us that a neurodivergent condition may qualify as a disability under the Equality Act. It demonstrates the importance of seeking HR or expert medical advice when you are uncertain about how to manage a neurodiverse employee and highlights the duty to make reasonable adjustments for a disability. The second case, Morgan versus Buckinghamshire Council, Morgan worked as a social worker and was dismissed after it was found she had breached professional boundaries with foster families she was working with. Her employer felt that they could not be confident that similar conduct would not be repeated if she remained employed. Morgan was recognised as having a disability related to her diagnosis of ASD and dyslexia. However, her claim was unsuccessful as the employment tribunal found that she had not been fairly dismissed, nor has she been discriminated against. They concluded that her employer's actions could be justified as a proportionate means of achieving a legitimate aim. So this case demonstrates that while an employee may have a disability, if this has been considered and adjustments have been made, their decision can still be objectively justified. In the third case, JC versus Gordon Stream Schools, the Court of Session in Scotland concluded that JC did not qualify as disabled under the Equality Act. They stated that her ADHD did not have a substantial impact on her ability to do day-to-day -day activities. It was not disputed that her ADHD did impact her social skills, but the effect of the condition in her case was not enough to meet the criteria of a legal definition. 
So this case emphasizes that all cases will be considered by the courts on an individual basis and neurodiversity will not always be considered as a disability from a legal perspective. So we would encourage you to err on the side of caution and assume that neurodivergent conditions will generally meet the definition though. You can minimize legal risks to your organization by ensuring you always explore the possibility of reasonable adjustments in all circumstances where you are aware of a disability or potential disability. Next slide, please. So who do we know that's uh, neurodiverse? I thought I'd just put a few famous faces up there really. So it's easy to talk about traits of neurodiversity, but it's also useful to demonstrate how successful and influential you can be when you have an atypical brain. Um, just a few examples on then, uh, Jamie Oliver um, has dyslexia. Lewis Capaldi has uh, recently um, said that he's been diagnosed with Tourette's. Emma Watson and Will Smith have ADHD. Steve Jobs describes himself as difficult to manage. <laughs> um, if anyone's seen the um, Netflix film, I think you'd appreciate that. Um, Elon Musk and Greta Thunberg are autistic and have ASD. Next slide, please. So I'm just gonna sort of focus on the benefits really um, to organizations of a couple of the most sort of well-known um, neurodiverse conditions. The first one, um, obviously that shows autism spectrum disorder. And as you can see, it includes a large variety of conditions. And I'm the first to admit, I'm not a, a, a clinical expert in the differences between a lot of these conditions, but what I think it does show us is that when an individual discloses that they have ASD, there are a huge amount of variables. And as managers, you will not be expected to understand the complexity of each of these. However, it is your responsibility with the information that has been disclosed to you to speak to that employee and try and understand how you can help support them in their work environment to be the best that they possibly can be. Next slide, please. So thinking about the, the benefits of a ASD employees, they're often associated with a variety of characteristics, such as being honest, reliable, punctual, and highly productive. Aside from those noticeable benefits, several others are frequently identified by employers and managers with autistic people in their teams. Autistic people often show high levels of loyalty. They recognize the struggle of finding meaningful um, employment and will therefore tend to stay with one company for much longer. This can help increase overall morale in the company and motivate all employees to value their jobs. Autistic people may look at things differently. In doing so, they often have excellent attention to detail and memory, which help them to be accurate and notice errors that may have been other, overlooked by others. Logical thinking patterns and creative skills help autistic people find innovative ways of solving problems. They will often accept alternative solutions and work out how to problem solve in ways that others may never have thought of. The willingness to experiment and adapt can motivate other employees as well as strengthen teamwork across the company. Next slide, please. So some of the common symptoms of ADHD can be sort of lack of focus, struggle with time management, a bit of disorganization and um, restlessness in meetings, for example. Here, as you can see, there are so many amazing positive traits though that ADHD people can bring to their roles and would be an asset to any organization. My hope is that we educate ourselves in, more in inclusion within the workplace across every area and that way we'll create diverse, innovative and incredible opportunities to set people up for success. Next slide, please. So this just shows a, couple, a few benefits of dyslexia, like dyslexia. So dyslexic employees have many advantages. They've got strong memories, excellent problem solving skills, critical thinkers, imaginative, empathetic, they are abstract thinkers, great conversationalists, brilliant spatial reasoning, and have the ability to really think outside the box. 
Next slide, please. So moving on to the benefits of a neurodiverse workforce, companies are beginning to see these benefits of incorporating neurodiversity into their recruitment and inclusion strategies. Neurodivergent people often possess creativity, lateral thinking and a different perspective, highly specialized skills and strict consistency. So hiring with neurodiversity in mind brings, means building stronger, more innovative and enriched teams. While social justice is often the initial driver, inclusion and diversity is becoming essential for organizations. I'm just gonna bring Jonathan back in now, if that's okay, Jonathan. We're just thinking about um, your thoughts really on how you have your experience of having a, a really neurodiverse organization and the, the benefits that you may have seen. Yeah, I quite like this popping back up. <laughs> situation um you can I, hide in the meantime <laughs> yeah i can have a wander around uh, this is actually <laughs> perfect if you have a new neurodiversity um uh, um so power orchestra didn't exist in 2015 uh, the charity was only set up that year um the so my starting point is that in the arts um we like to see see ourselves as a progressive liberal liberal sector and yet um disability and particularly neurodiversity has been completely ignored in terms of progress. So for Power Orchestra, the benefit is as much about um, presenting a relevant representative society in our organisation as a mirror to the rest of the art sector to change. Um, and that change is glacially slow in the classical sector, but we need to do that and we are trying to move as fast as we can to do that. Um, what we find with that difference being good is that the mix of musicians, um, you know, it's as much about their performance as it is about their personality. And char uh, our artistic director, our conductor is a um, is someone uh, is a man called Charles Hazelwood, who's worked in the classical sector all his life. Also identifies with neurodiversity. Um, Charles Wood talks regularly about um, the creativity. Um, at the heart of the ensemble. And we work with composers uh, across the spectrum that we want to understand the musicians and their personalities so that they can get the best out of them. Um, and also so the music can be different and feel more emotive because it's got the musicians at heart. So the benefits you know, are based, for us, it's better performances. Um, and from a workforce perspective, um, in terms of my staff that, are, that run all the projects and run the orchestra. Um, I think the benefits, we're, we're learning about the benefits really, because some of those things that you've just been talking about feel really apparent, and some of them don't because, um, the, because of the stigma. So um, I, I, th I think it's really, it's all right to feel like you don't quite know that yet. You know, is it a good thing or a bad thing? Well, it's what people are. And you, you know, coming back to the stigma point as well, you've evolved as, organ, you know, and uh, potentially, well, are quite much further ahead than a lot of organisations now, aren't you? And I think it is about evolving and learning all the time. And I'm sure you're, you're still, you're still doing that. Yeah, I mean, we're set up and I, I would hope that I lead the organisation in a really open way. You know, we know that we do not know everything. You know, disability is such a broad term, neurodiversity is such a broad term and a new term. So, so we just have a very open culture from myself, from Charles as the conductor of the orchestra, from our senior management team to, to want to learn more and understand that we're going to need to change along our way. You know, we're, we're going through this really rapid growth period that um, we're very grateful to Naraki to help us in terms of things like staff manuals and our staff restructure. And it and it's hard because we need to think about the HR practice in terms of being um, open for everyone to, to work with. And yet HR practice sometimes is all about performance and targets. And as we've just talked about, some of those targets are, you know, if someone is has a different way of responding to an email, that doesn't mean they're not good at their job. No, um, absolutely, yeah. So it, it, it's, it's, you know, I would say as a chief executive, there are moments that are uncomfortable, um, but the benefits is, you know, if you, 
um, I mean, in really brutal money terms, Power Orchestra has grown from being an organisation that that has a hundred thousand pounds of income a year to in the next year to having two point five million pounds of income, and some of that is about us being representative and bringing on board funders and partners that want that as well. So, you know, there is a financial return to it if you want to be really brutal about it. But for us, it's less about the money and more about how to be representative. And that's it. That's what organisations just want and need to achieve, isn't it? Just being representative of our population. Uh, uh, I think that's a really good point. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll bring you back in in a minute, Jonathan, so don't, don't go too far, but um, next slide, please, because we're going to be moving on to considering um, reasonable adjustments. So supporting neurodivergent employees is very individual, as, as we've said, and not everyone will need reasonable adjustments. The best starting point is to talk to the employees themselves, and they are likely to know what has worked for them in previous roles. Sometimes the most helpful adjustments are the most straightforward. For neurodivergent workers, common adjustments might be related to focus, attentiveness, and propensity to become distracted. Micro breaks, working from an environment free of distractions, the ability to listen to music or white noise while working, or even working from home can be useful. Others may benefit from support with social interaction in the workplace and coaching tailored to their specific needs. It's often beneficial to seek uh, expert advice for an uh, occupational health advisor or medical professionals for additional ideas on what the employee may benefit from. Many adjustments are low cost. A recent study found that the average cost of putting in place a reasonable adjustment was only £95. However, don't forget that the employee may be eligible for funding support from Access to Work, which is a publicly funded employment support programme that provides practical or financial support for those with a disability or long term health condition. The programme can be especially helpful to support the employee um, if they've been if it's recommended as being particularly costly. A supportive line management relationship is vital to keep communication open regarding what's working and what isn't. To keep and to keep adjustments under review. Any condition is likely to fluctuate in how it affects the individual, so it's important to be responsive to these changes. Jonathan, what are your thoughts on sort of reasonable adjustments? Could you give us a, a few examples maybe of things that you have um, um, been asked to or things you put in place? And also my other question is, have, have you ever been asked to make an adjustment that you feel that you're unable to accommodate? Um, I don't think we've been asked to make an adjustment that we've been able we've been unable to accommodate um, because our setup does want to go beyond reasonable adjustment. Um, so we have a very person centred uh, setup at Power Orchestra. If you're a musician and you join the ensemble, the first question that the team will ask you is to is to complete an access rider, um, and that is almost less about medical. Uh, the medical situation you're in and more about what you might need to work at your best um, and we try to it's interesting you've just raised access to work because I would say from the off that our understanding is that it can be really helpful for, for particular individuals that fit the criteria but the paperwork and the stress of going through it um, and then needing it to be reviewed every certain period of time for those individuals can be can be a lot if they're not if they don't have any support and they okay. do and people often get turned down for it for particular things that actually might be because of their neuro, neurodiversity that they're unable to present in a certain way so it's really tricky so for us it's about um individuals telling us uh it, you know creating an open environment so individuals can tell us what they need and then we will provide it and um, from the off, I will say that does mean it's more expensive and it involves more people. Um, so from a staff perspective, someone will fill in an access rider um, either when they join the organisation now or if their situation changes and they and they recognise a neurodiversity. Um, and some of the reasonable adjustments that we've made are actually really simple. Uh, it's understanding that some staff members need a break in a long meeting. Mm. Um, they need the information clearly presented be before the meeting. Uh, I would point out some like there's some really easy adjustments for us in understanding how people work. So I have 
members of the team that take a bit more time on a Monday to get going because the, their brain will be spooling up. So we don't put heavy duty meetings on a Monday. We might have moved them to the Wednesday. We won't have a one-to-one on the Monday. We'll give those individuals a bit more time to really kind of work through their work plan for the week. Um, there's as much about the reasonable adjustments that, that someone might be suggesting, helping managers understand them so that in a meeting, particularly on Zoom, um, if someone with a neurodiversity is presenting in a certain way and it might not look that emotional, uh, that doesn't mean that they aren't listening or, or interested in what the other person who might not have a neurodiversity is saying. Mm. So there's those things. And then from a musician perspective, and I recognise, I'm imagining there's not many people on this call that run an orchestra. <laughs> um, uh, we offer a whole range of things for the musician to be able, because it's all about their performance. It's not about their neurodiversity. So it might be about them being able to take breaks and rehearsals. It might be, we always have a quiet space. If someone needs to go to a quiet space that isn't a dressing room and have some time out. Uh, as I said, Charles, our conductor will understand that different people in the room will need different things and he'll work to that rather than just to one model. Um, we always have a medical assistant on our larger projects who is not there as a, they are a trained nurse, but they're not there as a nurse. They're just there to offer the team advice and to offer the musicians advice as they need them. Um, uh, we will offer travel and accommodation to, to musicians if they do it the night before a rehearsal. So it's not, if they need to get their brain capacity needs to kind of like calm down, uh, we would pay for their travel and accommodation the day before rather than turn up on a day. Uh, we also pay for assistance if they need it and that access to work doesn't cover, cover it. So I guess we do a lot, probably, yeah, compared I mean, to another organisation. There's some brilliant examples there. I like the sort of travelling up the day before, because I imagine if someone's travelling to go in any organisation to a really big meeting or something the night before and getting themselves there for a nine o'clock start or something could potentially cause quite a lot of anxiety and, and, and concern and things. And so... Um, yeah, that's an interesting one. Thank you. Can I just um, chip in for both of you with a, a couple of comments and questions that have come in? One, one is a comment um, where somebody says that um, their husband is um, highly likely to have, to have some neurodiversity, but has waited 20 plus months for a diagnosis and is apparently still six months away from being offered appointment. Um, but has been able to work ev every day of his working life. So that's just an observation that's come in, which is which is really wow. interesting. Yeah. Um, another question saying, can we recommend any training for line managers? And that's going to be something that we include in the follow up. So um, Helen uh, has done a session um, which she can run for clients, um, which is essentially a variation of this session, which we would do for line managers to raise awareness and talk about some of the really practical issues. So we can include some details of that in our follow up. Um, the other question has come in is around um, whether we can share options to access to work, which again, we can do that in our in our follow up. Have you documented the reasonable adjustments once agreed? And we would always say with any reasonable adjustments around any kind of, uh, of situation you're considering that it's really important that that's a dialogue between you as the employer and the individual and that you do have a record of that. Um, that doesn't need to be anything particularly formal. It could be on, on an email trail, but absolutely have a record and keep it under review because you need to, to, to check in about, are these things actually working? Do we need to do anything else? Have things changed? The second half of that question is, has it been received by neurodiverse staff, mindful of those who've been told to keep their disabilities to themselves and wouldn't want things to be written down? So can I just ask for your views on that? Um, Jonathan, do you have any views on that one? Uh, yeah, I'd say that um, uh, we the feedback from our musicians is consistently excellent, um, and they uh, and we're not looking for praise from them, but but they 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 know that when they come to our orchestra, it is a safe space for them to be able to perform amazing music but also have any support that they might need to do that. And they don't need to worry about it. And we are aware that other orchestras who are trying to generate ensembles that might have disabled performers in them because they don't have the ethos, they don't have the, the history that they, 
that some of our musicians might be freelancing with them and they don't have a good experience. So I'm really confident and comfortable in saying that the feedback loop, I know that we do a good job. Um, from a staff perspective, I think it's it's really interesting and much more nuanced because you're working a full-time job or a part-time job with us and um, and you've had this stigma and you're probably just learning about your, your neurodiversity and you possibly can't get a GP's appointment or a follow-up one. So um, we do get good feedback because we are open to make adjustments and we are making adjustments. Um, and I would love to be able to do in, in two years time is to be able to, to, to have a formal, I, we don't have a formal staff survey feedback yet for it because it's still so new. Um, and, and we're about to go through a big recruitment round because we're doubling in size in the next year. And what I'm interested in is that we've made a lot of adjustments and we're being quite open about it. So does that mean that we will attract candidates who identify as disabled or neurodiverse or deaf? Like I would love to be able to say in a year's time, we're more likely to attract those candidates. Um, that's the aim. Yeah. I read, I read something the other day that people I don't know about I think about 60% of people now will look at um they will go onto the website before they go to an interview for an organization and look at their diversity inclusion policies and you know review it before they even attend an interview so I think it's it's, it's really important to just think about how as a brand you are you know and as an organization what you're what you're putting out there as well as to how sort of inclusive you are I'll move on to a little bit more of that in the next slide, please. So given the uniqueness of each and every person and the fact we're all so diverse in many aspects, not just our brains and our minds, everyone has the potential to contribute in a valuable way to organisational success if given the opportunity to made to be feel accepted for who they are and recognised for their contribution, whatever that may be. So how do we challenge and change our thinking? Perhaps we need to start by seeking to normalize neurodivergence, as Jonathan said. After all, autism and other learning difficulties are fairly common with 15% of the population, as we said, being neurodiverse. Normally, these things start with as simply as, as talking about it, as Jonathan has suggested. As well as not understanding or knowing a, a huge amount about neurodiversity issues or what autism is, for example, or how someone with ADHD might respond in a traditional environment. There's also a real lack of understanding amongst employers and HR staff of the benefits and contributions that neurodiversity can bring. So as well as raising awareness and sharing knowledge, which is key, we need to ideally form some sort of training or associated activities for line managers, directors, trustees, non-execs, staff representatives, and all employees to encourage employees to share their conditions, educate themselves about it, and champion diversity to ensure that accessing, employees can access the support that they need. Taking positive steps to engage and attract neurodiverse candidates at the recruitment stage is a great way of sending a positive message to both existing staff and potential recruits that you are an inclusive employer. According to Harvard Business, many employees who are neurodivergent have higher than average abilities. Research shows that some conditions can bespose special skills in pattern recognition, memory, and maths. So why wouldn't you want to take advantage of this to give your business the competitive advantage? Yet those affected often struggle to fit the profile sought by prospective employers. So if you're recruiting for a role that requires a unique set of skills or qualities, which may be creativity, lateral thinking, and bringing a different perspective to the table, then consider how you can engage and reach out to those who are neurodivergent and who have so much to offer. Um, I'm just referring to the, the point I just made. So it was the um, 2017 study by PwC that showed 61% of women and 48% of men said they would look at the diversity of a company's leadership and re review their website before they decided whether to accept an offer and really do their research first. So my question to you is if someone checked your business diversity credentials, what would your website branding reputation say about you? 
Procter & Gamble partnered with the National Autistic Society to recruit through a neurodiversity work experience program. The program provided opportunity for individuals to join an intern or apprenticeship scheme. Procter & Gamble said that the workforce includes both neurotypical and neurodiverse thinking styles and it can drive innovation and a result in better products. IBM did something similar when they partnered in 2017 with Special Stern to create a neurodiversity recruitment program. Next slide, please. So my last slide is really sort of some top tips for embracing neurodiversity in the workplace. So the first one, raise awareness and promote a diverse workforce. So make sure your employees and managers have the knowledge and breadth of understanding in what it means to create and empower a diverse team. Think about your culture, where individuals feel comfortable to disclose and open, talk openly about their neuro, neurodiversity. Um, empower your employees to provide feedback on what they can do to support and what they feel that they need support wise. Some employees have seen great success in, in employee voice networks for DE and I, and provide this type of feedback and champion their success stories. Attract and retain a talented pool of um, employees. So if the role you're creating requires someone with a special skill set, consider advertising in a way that reaches out to those groups of candidates. Ensure you make adjustments during the recruitment process and identify ways to alleviate anxiety, which is a common feeling during the interview for candidates with neurodivergent qualities. An example that I've had recently with a client is that someone has requested to have the interview questions in advance of the interview and um, we decided that that would be fine we gave all all the candidates the questions in advance in that specific situation use positive language um, and inclusive language at all times so ensure your mission statement and visions and values represent the culture of inclusivity and ensure all your communication whether that be hr policies procedures job adverts, job descriptions, etc. cetera, um, demonstrate you are serious about the culture of inclusivity. Consider whether you might benefit from a specific policy on neurodiversity. And if that's something of interest, then please do feel free to contact us. We can support you with that. Um, line manager support. So managers need to focus on fostering an open relationship with the employee and ask them what um, requirements that they have any additional support and guidance. Um, you need to handle performance issues sensitively and appropriately and make any allowances. Um, for example, you might consider noise levels for those with auditory sensitivities or different fonts, colors for those who are dyslexic. Individuals with autism might be sensitive to things like temperature, light and sound. As such, you may need to provide accommodations such as noise cancelling headphones, privacy rooms or flexible work schedules so employees can be their most productive. We talked about maybe shortening the length of meetings. If you an organisation that has back to back meetings regularly, can you make them 50 minutes or even 55 minutes instead of an hour to allow that employee to have a little break before the next meeting? Be aware of your legal obligations. So some employees, as we said, might be covered under the Equality Act. So you might, you will need to consider that reasonable adjustment point that we covered earlier. Reward and recognition, ensure that all employees are treated fairly when opportunities arise, whether that be promotion, training, development, or flexible working requests, for example. And recognition is really important for neurodivergent um, individuals. Really tell them when they've done a good job because that really goes a long way. And finally, be patient. Um, building a neurodiverse candidate pool takes, you know, it does take time. Um, you will need to invest in training and educating and considering um, all the practical things that you can put in place and particularly around your recruitment strategy, but hopefully we will all get there. <laughs> um, Caitlin, I'll hand back to you. 
Brilliant. So we have got quite a few questions. I'm conscious of time, but um, let's try and get through at least some of them. Um, and we can always follow up on any that we don't get um, to, to mention. Um, so, and Jonathan, it may be that you have got things you can add to these uh, as well. So somebody says, um, one of our issues is that colleagues feel they may be neurodiverse, but can't access testing or get a diagnosis. Um, so they don't really know what they need necessarily because it's all new to them. Does the panel have any advice? Jonathan, I'm going to ask you if you before I chip in. <laughs> um, I, I could probably say that that's oh, that's the biggest challenge. Um, we, yeah, that that it's quite hard to answer that because I don't know what the culture in that organisation is like. I when we have our access riders either with a musician or a staff member um there's no question that for us about that person fitting one of those in which is like explaining who they are and how they how they might want to work and then having to do another one six months later if the if they get a different diagnosis or something has changed in their life um, the challenge at the very beginning is is that we all need a bit of help don't we um is that you might have read something in a paper and recognize yourself in that. But, and I'm thinking particularly around ADHD, that's such a, a uh, it's become so pr prominent in, in understanding recently. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I don't know if I have, a, a, I think that's an HR challenge, isn't it? Because, <laughs> because and, and I know when we did our staff manual, there's a, there's a challenge of, re of understanding if some someone is, that what's the what is the disability it, is it about are you now in the point where you need to make reasonable adjustments or not and if you are unsure as an hr manager or as a or as a senior manager it's better to assume than not but the person does need to make that step and that's really difficult yeah and and that does come up in in some of the in some of the other questions and i think probably um, that is absolutely the challenge and some of this is around making sure you're having a productive a conversation as you possibly can between you and that individual um, around what might be helpful and being really open-minded and being willing to review that and change if things are not working or other ideas come along is probably um, a really good starting point. Um, there's a question about occupational health referrals and and yes I suppose occupational health could be something that you might want to consider as part of the range of things that, that you look at. The, the second part of that question is um, is where an employee might be closed to discussing their concerns and that again I think is a real challenge um, around the management of this um, because you need to take your lead I think from from the employee in terms of what they think might be helpful um, but obviously you as an employer need to be managing the role and making sure that um, you are doing what you can to get the best out of that person so any quick thoughts around that where somebody might be closed off to having these discussions I mean, I think for me, it comes back to the sort of the, the open culture. I think that, you know, it's sort of finding out, there's, I suppose there's two things. There's one, not maybe having a diagnosis and not really understanding what that means. And the, the second point is really finding a way to make them feel safe and um, comfortable in, in talking about that. I think, um, and, and that will come with the more you sort of, change your view on how I guess how you portray that in your organization and it sort of comes from educating people and sort of having that that training element I think so people understand that it, it is important to that business um the, the training that I did for the organization a few weeks ago on this you know they were all so invested and engaged and they were all really open in the in the session because it was a, a safe space to do it and then so I think it's about creating that and then working with them to try and understand talk about examples of situations do you struggle in meetings do you you know is it hard to manage your workload try and sort of I guess dig a bit deeper as to how what elements of the role that they are finding difficult um and it, it, as Jonathan, it doesn't matter if you're diagnosed or not in some ways, in the sense that, you know, you need to sort of get the grips of the challenges they face on a day to day basis in, a, in their role and then sort of treat each one separately and think about what 
you can do to support. Absolutely. Um, and, and so I'll just pick up finally one, one last point, which you've just touched on, it is whether people have the same level of support and protection in terms of the Equality Act, if you have a diagnosis or if you don't have a diagnosis. In a sense, that isn't what matters. The defini definition of a disability in terms of the Equality Act is, a, is around the impact that it's having. So you need to look at that definition. And as an employer, you need to look at what's going on and think whether or not it, it would be sensible to have those conversations about reasonable adjustments in any event as, as good practice within the workplace.